Yes, thank you. So I'll be telling you about an environment for program design, uh, which is developed by our former student, Junya. So um, when we solve a problem by writing a program, we explicitly or implicitly follow a sequence of steps. These steps can be divided into two groups, the designing steps and the coding steps. In the designing steps, we analyze the information involved in the problem, and then we decide the representation of the input and output data, and then we design the shape of the computation. And in the coding steps, uh, we write a complete program and check its correctness by running tests or by some other means. So in programming courses, we often focus on the coding steps, but as experienced programmers, we know that the designing steps are equally important. So the decisions made in this phase uh, would greatly affect the, the maintainability of the final outcome. Um, therefore, uh, in the functional programming course that I am teaching at Tokyo Tech, I say to our students, hey, program design is important. We should pay attention to the design process, not just to coding. Mm -hmm. However, designing a program is a highly non-trivial task. And to teach how to design programs, we need to give our students a clear guideline that lists all the required steps. So do we have such a guideline? Yes, we do. So there is a guideline called the program design recipe introduced in the textbook called How to Design Programs. The design recipe uh, tells the programmer what to do in what order, starting from data definition all the way to testing. I have experience in both learning and teaching the design recipe. I have also observed how Matthias Felaisen, who is one of the authors of this textbook, uses the design recipe in his course at Northeastern. And from these experiences, I learned that the design recipe helps a lot. So if you really strictly follow the recipe, then it is often very easy to write a program that is correct and easy to read. So um, in my functional programming course, I use the design recipe in every lesson, uh, showing the students how to define data types, uh, how to create examples, and so on. And then, when the students go home and work on their homework, they should follow the recipe, right? <laughs> well, unfortunately, no. So the students may skip the design uh, designing steps for various reasons, such as the lack of motivation, the need for learning new syntax, and the lack of feedback. So let me explain these uh, reasons one by one. So first, um, there are several steps in the design recipe that would appear unimportant to students. For instance, a purpose statement is just a comment, so it doesn't directly contributes to the final program, it, um, although it does help you understand the problem. So when the student's goal is to write a program that passes all the tests, it is very hard for them to have the motivation to follow those steps. Secondly, um, several uh, designing steps require the use of complex syntax. Um, for example, to write a template, which is an incomplete program with holes, uh, the students need to use some informal notations uh, representing the holes. And this notation is not part of the programming language they use for coding. And this prevents the students from actually following the recipe, even if they wish to do so. And thirdly, the outcomes of the designing steps 
are not always checkable in a standard programming environment. As an example, we don't have a way to check the correctness of a template because it's not a proper program in the first place. So these issues are a great obstacle to learning how to design programs. When the students are unwilling or unable to follow the recipe, they would jump straight to coding and without sufficient experience in going through the design process, they are likely to get stuck when they are given a hard problem. Indeed, I've seen my students um, spending hours facing a blank editor, uh, which is what the design recipe uh, aims to avoid. So how can we solve this problem? Our approach is to create a, a programming environment dedicated to program design. This is our prototype called Meal, and it has three main features. First, um, Meal provides blocks for composing design artifacts. So the programmer does not need to remember the syntax used in the designing steps. Second, um, Mio generates the text representation of the blocks on the fly. Um, so the programmer can see their progress and use the generated code in the coding steps. And thirdly, uh, Mio provides feedback on the outcomes of designing steps. So the programmer will know at each step uh, whether they are doing things right. So let me show you how we design programs in Mio using a concrete example. So suppose we are given a program like this. Uh, define a function called area that computes the area of a given shape, which is either a square or a triangle. Okay, and we are going to use the Scala syntax for the generated code. All right, um, so this is what Mio looks like when we launch it. It has a block panel on the left, a workspace in the middle, and an editor on the right. Our first task is to compose a data definition. <coughs> and here's the outcome. So uh, we define the shape data type using three kinds of blocks. Uh, specifying the data type name, the data type constructors, and the constructor arguments. And this data definition is converted into a class declaration in Scala. And as we can see, the, the code involves several uh, keywords that a beginning student may not be familiar with. But in Mio, um, there is no need to write this keywords uh, thanks to blocks. Um, having defined the dead type, uh, we click on the next button and to proceed to data examples. So here we create two data examples, one for a square and the other for a triangle. So the example blocks on, in the block panel uh, are automatically generated by meal uh, according to the data definition from the previous step. And in the editor, uh, we see the Scala representation of the data examples, which is just to vowel statements. So this is simpler than the data definition, but uh, the blocks are uh, also useful in this case. Um, in particular, they prevent ill-formed data examples that lack constructor arguments. So this completes the step one of the design recipe. We next move on to step two. In this step, we write a purpose statement and specify the input and output types of the function. In Mio, we do this by simply filling in the holes of the purpose and signature block. And then we obtain 
uh, something called a function header in the editor. Um, note that the original uh, design recipe requires a dummy output in the body of the header because it makes the header runnable and allows the programmer to do a <coughs> syntactic check. But in Neo, we don't require such an output because uh, the blocks will guarantee the syntactic correctness. All right, that's step two. Uh, let's move on to step three and create input output examples. So for the area function, uh, we create two input output pairs. Uh, here, the square and triangle blocks uh, represent the data examples we composed earlier. And these blocks show up automatically when we proceed to this step. And the input output examples are converted into Scala equations. And these equations are later used as the test of the function. OK, now we are left with the final step of the designing phase, which is template. A template tells us um, how the function processes its input without telling us how the function actually computes the output. In this case, the template um, is a pattern matching on the shape input. And since shape has two cases, the pattern matching has two clauses. And on the right-hand side of each clause, we write the constructor arguments to remember that we are going to use these values to compute the final output. The scalar representation of the template looks like this. As we can see, this is not a proper scalar program due to the presence of da da da. <laughs> OK. So now we are done with all the designing steps. For the remaining steps, namely coding <coughs> and testing, we switch to text mode. So currently, Mio doesn't support text editing. So we just copy the generated code to some other editor and uh, complete the function definition. And we run the test using an um, installed Scala interpreter or something like that. Yes. Um, so that's uh, what we can do with Mio. And uh, let me also show you uh, what kind of feedback <coughs> Mio gives us. So Mio uh, performs some very simple <coughs> checks on the outcomes of the designing steps. Um, more specifically, it checks the <coughs> well-formedness of the design artifacts and the consistency across design steps. As an instance of the uh, well-formedness checking, uh, suppose the programmer has created <coughs> an example for a square, but did not supply the constructor argument. In this case, uh, Mio complains that the constructor argument is missing. And as an instance of the <coughs> consistency checking, uh, suppose the programmer has created a well-formed example for square, but not an example for triangle. In this case, uh, Mio warns the programmer that the data example is insufficient. And when the programmer has solved all these issues, they will see a um, uh, positive feedback, like step something OK. OK, so that's what we can do with Mio. Um, it's still in a, at a very early stage of development, so we haven't really used this environment to teach in class yet. But uh, we did a preliminary experiment at the end of my functional programming course this year. So in this experiment, uh, we asked our students to design the area function in Mio and tell us what they liked and what they didn't like. And here are some comments from the students. Um, overall, the students 
enjoyed programming in Mio. Uh, they liked the block interface, which makes the programming like solving a jigsaw puzzle. And they also liked the code generation, which gives them a live coding like experience. Um, some students found uh, programming in Mio easier than <coughs> programming in a standard editor because they don't need to remember all the English keywords and deal with syntax errors. Uh, the students also loved the feedback. Um, they felt encouraged and motivated when they saw positive comments, uh, positive feedback from Mio. On the other hand, uh, some students, especially those who already had some prior programming experience, uh, thought that it's easier to use text to uh, develop programs instead of using blocks. And this is a perfectly reasonable argument because the current view is designed only for beginning students. So we are hoping to do a real user experiment in the future. And to do that, we need to extend Mio uh, in various ways. Uh, first, we would like to extend Mio with uh, recursive data types. So in the, uh, how to design programs, uh, there are different design recipes for different types of recursion, uh, including structural, mutual, accumulative, and generative recursion. Uh, we plan to support uh, provide different modes of recursion and ask the programmer to pick one at the beginning of development. Um, secondly, uh, we would like to support code, gen code generation in different languages. This should be straight, uh, straightforward because our, our blocks are designed in a language neutral way. And another extension we would like to implement is to allow some use of text. Uh, the idea is to borrow some insights from the existing hybrid environment. So for instance, there is an environment called BlockPy, which allows the user to switch between blocks and text at any time. Uh, we believe that um, allowing text editing is the key to uh, broaden the users of Mio. Okay, so um, in conclusion, uh, we think we should teach program design using a dedicated environment and that we can make programming program design more accessible by providing the block interface. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> are there are there questions in the room or from folks online? Yes. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, this this seems pretty amazing. I love how you um, have the these parts of the design recipe that are just uh, like in comments. Now you have an explicit the ID you can understand it. That mm -hmm. seems like a fantastic thing. I never would have thought of trying this with blocks. So. <laughs> Um, one thing I've seen students uh, be very helpful with them, when, if you actually have this information that I need to consider maybe adding to your list, mm -hmm. um, is the, in the inventory step, so like if they're writing some complex function mm -hmm. and they can't see right away how to put the pieces together. Um, so if you're writing the sum function, you know, you're just missing a plus and a zero and you're good to go, right? But if you're writing yeah. something more complex, mm -hmm. then seeing exactly what the, what the template is giving you mm -hmm. and how that's connected to what you're trying to do Mm -hmm. um, is something that I've seen students struggle with in the same way you described the struggles in the beginning of the talk. Yeah. And it seems like this could be a, a great, uh, you know, the Mio could offer a lot of support to students. Yes. You know, to take their to take their examples and actually show them, you know, this is what the example what this example turns into with these spots. Mm -hmm. This is what you're going for in the spot. Oh look, we missed a test case that would sort of cover what this recursion is giving you back at this mm -hmm. stop. You know. This, this, so anyway, this seems, this seems really amazing. Uh, thank you. Are there other questions? 
Um, I was wondering how how do you expect students maybe to, to iterate, go back and forth between the design phase and the coding? Oh, yes. Um, so actually, in MIO, we support this kind of back and forth development. So you can go back to previous steps. Hi. Um, so the idea that students write this purpose statement um, mm -hmm. at the signature of the function makes me wonder, um, since you mentioned the motivation being one of the problems, did you look at things like Copilot, where you could use this, this purpose statement and the, the signature to just have an automated version of the function being generated to show them that it, it has meaning what you're doing here? Uh, so you are suggesting that we can synthesize programs? So, so uh, kind of with the idea, so in the beginning, is that one of the problems is that how do you motivate students to write the, this um, statement of, of purpose of, of what is this function supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether, since students are already doing that in meal, mm -hmm. whether you, you kind of or you could experiment by integrating this with a copilot or something, where once you have this, this <coughs> statement of purpose and the, the signature of the function, mm -hmm. you can use kind of like machine learning to, to put in the actual code in the function to show them if, if you do the first steps well, Mm -hmm. It has actually, it, it makes life easier because then the machine can help you solve the problem. Ah, we've never thought about that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. So anecdotally, we've we've tried that a little bit at Northeastern. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, in the simple cases, it works perfectly and convinces students that they don't actually have to do their homework. And as soon as you get past the simple cases, <laughs> it gives you garbage. Um, and the problem is, since students haven't actually written the simple functions, they don't know when it crosses the line from correct to garbage. So it's, it's kind of counterproductive for the audience that we're targeting to encourage them to do that. <laughs> Sorry if I might just kind of a brief follow up on the end. Um, perhaps kind of, of one uh, variant of that is this way of actually, um, I don't know, show the students the code, mm -hmm. uh, but where you could use that to give them further feedback on, hey, the code you've written is actually correct because you can compare it to, to something um, like what, is, what comes out of, of this, this copilot or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so just, I, I feel kind of, of there's some potential to, to tap into in, uh, this, this system in some way or not. Yeah, so actually one of the students in our group is working on something related to purpose statements. So the, the idea is that when you have recursive functions, um, you have this uh, recursive calls in the templates, but sometimes the students don't understand what the recursive call means. But if you have a purpose statement, we can generate an explanation of that recursive call, and that would be helpful to beginning students. Um, I, I think it's related to what, or maybe not, not as far reaching as what you're saying, but I also really think the really cool idea here is this taking, yeah, like taking something that would normally just be a comment, like just an arbitrary text, basically, where the student has the impression that it doesn't do anything, it's yeah. just they are, it sort of, they could delete it and nothing would change, and like turning that into a <coughs> block that is sort of more tangible for them or like more present in a sense. Yeah. And um, so I was a bit surprised that you were actually only using this for the designing part. It seems yeah. like the whole implementation that happens sort of based on the generated text. I was wondering yeah. if that's another way where you could basically push this further by if you were to also have the programming happen in like in blocks still. And I, I think right now, for example, you generate like some of the steps generate generate blocks that are used in later steps, mm -hmm. which I think really shows the student that something is happening here, that it's not just arbitrary yeah. commenting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm wondering if like, you could sort of extend that even further for, into the implementation. Yeah, we can, of course, do block-based programming for the coding steps. But um, I think when we have a complete template, then the code required for completing that template is not a lot, usually. I mean, if the 
problem is very simple. So, um, yeah, we are currently just, uh, we, we are not fixing the coding step to text only. We can, of course, support uh, block based programming. Yeah, I think you were sort of hinting at it already with one of the extensions that you were describing, right? The, yeah. There was one of them was like this kind of mixing of text. Yes, tools. yes. That seems like really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from folks online that we haven't gotten? Go ahead. Hi. My name is Agustin uh, from Agustin Rafael Martinez from University of Buenos Aires. Uh, I, I get the idea uh, of this uh, design conception that you presented. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it looks like a waterfall model of stages in the process uh, of, of creating a program. And I understand that you, you started from that motivation to, to build this new tool. But in, usually in block-based languages like Scratch, for instance, in, in the paper, they defend the language saying that one of the characteristics is liveness. Mm -hmm. The idea uh, that the block-based language, we can use it and have, it, have an immediate feedback. Right. Um, but here in this project, uh, block-based program or the block-based uh, structure that the children build, they produce a text that is not already it's not ready for being interpreted. Mm. It's more work. So the question is, uh, don't you think maybe uh, losing liveness or adding liveness to this project to be something important? considering that uh, Scratch and so, they, they have presented that as one of the key characteristics. Um, so, I think this uh, automatic code generation is already giving the students live coding experience. And we certainly can't uh, actually run the code, right, because it's incomplete. So I, I'm not sure how to add any liveness. <laughs> um, I, I just had a little suggestion. Because um, you're saying that maybe the code is not runnable because it's not complete. But I don't know if you've heard of uh, Hazel out of Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, they do something like that. So right. maybe that could be a point of interest. Ah, that's interesting. Yes. I think that could be really cool, actually, with what you have so far to see it all the way through. Yeah, yeah it's just a computation with a bunch of holes. So, yeah, thank you. So there is a question online um, asking about the waterfall design process and whether, um, whether there's something to be done to mitigate it and to be more agile. I don't think I understand the problem of the question. So the the design recipe is very much a feed forward process from the purpose statement to the code, and agile is a is a development model that's more iterative and iteratively assigned. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if. Agile is used for education. I, I'm not familiar with this thing, so hard to answer. <laughs> but yeah, we should look at look into it. I can make a comment on that question. I assume that this uh, design conception is a premise of, of your project. 
and you start it with that premise and, and you go on with that. Uh, having an agile point of view, will be started with another conception of how a programming language, how the programming process is, and it will take you in another direction. So you have your point of view about the programming, how to develop software, and you you produce a tool for that point of view, and that's, that's okay for me. All right, are there any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker.